Here is a common Newtonian fluid, water, in a cup. From experience, you can probably guess what will happen when it's stirred. As you can see, a little dip near the stirring rod is formed when the fluid is stirred. You may have been able to predict this outcome without any knowledge of the forces at play, but if you're a little more acquainted with fluid mechanics, you probably cited the centrifugal force generated by the stirring as the reason for the fluid moving towards the edges of the glass and away from the stirring rod. Now I'll present you with a cup filled with a polymer solution. Do you expect the same behavior as with the Newtonian fluid? Interesting. So why exactly does this non-Newtonian fluid behave differently? Well, rheological behavior can give rise to many interesting phenomena. This lecture will focus on the flow dynamics of polymeric liquids and how they deviate from Newtonian liquids in interesting ways. We're also going to talk about how normal stresses can be used to explain these phenomena. Let's start by discussing why the polymer solution climbs up the stirring rod. Let's move to the whiteboard. So the phenomena displayed earlier actually has a name and it's called the Weissenberg effect. It can be seen both visually and by applying pressure taps within the fluid as shown in the diagrams here. For a Newtonian fluid, you'll find that the pressure at B is greater than the pressure at A. And for a non-Newtonian fluid that exhibits the Weissenberg effect, you're going to get a pressure at A being greater than that at B. So why exactly is this the case? Well, let's take a look at the math. First, we're gonna start with our assumptions. So for this system, we're gonna assume that it is a steady laminar flow and the flow is incompressible. We're also going to be using cylindrical coordinates to describe this system because those are the coordinates that best work for this geometry. So from these assumptions, we can make a few other statements. The first being that the only velocity that we're going to have in this system is the velocity in that angular direction. So we're only going to have that angular velocity in this system. The velocity in the radial direction and the velocity in the z direction are both zero. Additionally, that flow in the angular direction, that angular velocity, is only a function of the radius. And the stress tensor, tau ij, is only a function of the radius as well. These satisfy the continuity equation, which is just conservation of mass. So we can take these assumptions and these statements and actually use them to simplify the equations of motion. So once we've simplified the equations down, here are the simple equations for the r, theta, and z directions. Now, we have these equations, but you may be wondering, what is the stress tensor, tau ij? So on this slide, I'm gonna talk a bit about stress tensors and tensor notation. Now this could take entire lectures to explain, uh, but I'll try and give a quick crash course on it just so that we can understand the equations on the previous slide a little bit better. So our differential volume here is drawn as a cube and it's sitting on the x1, x2, x3 axes. So. I'm gonna label each face of this cube based on which axis it is perpendicular to. So this front face is perpendicular to axis one. So we're gonna call it face one, face two, and face three. And then these uh, arrows coming off are actually the traction vectors or the stress vectors that are coming off of each face. And these can point in any direction. So they can be made up of a combination of stresses in the x1, x2, and x3 dimensions. So essentially we can call these our stress, our stress vectors here. So this is on the one on phase three. And we can actually break each of these stresses up into its individual components. So each of these arrows can be broken up into its x1, x2, and x3 components of the stress. So we can call this one uh, tau three one. So it's on phase three and it is in the x1 direction tau 3, 2, and tau 3, 3. So essentially what we have is a stress tensor. And the first value is I and the second is J as described on the previous page. And the I essentially represents which face the stress is being applied to. And the J describes the component of the stress. So the direction of like each component of the stress. So this can be in the X1, X2, or x3 component. And this can be on phase one, two, or three. So we can actually take this and apply it to our cylindrical coordinates that we're looking at. So we can think about our faces as being either r, theta, or z. So i can be r, theta, or z in cylindrical coordinates, and j can also be the r component, the theta component, and the z component. And before we go back to the original equations that are on the previous slide, I just want to talk a little bit about the normal stress. So as we talked about, we have these faces here. So again, phase one, phase two, phase three, and we have our stresses in each 
dimension, and we have our vectors acting on each face. And as we defined them, each face is perpendicular to an axis. So if you want to think about the normal stresses in this system here, in the cube system, we're going to say that for, say, face one, so face one, the normal stress is going to be in the x1 direction. So this is the normal stress on face one. And again, the same can be said for tau 2, 2 and tau 3, 3. And if we want to transition that to cylindrical coordinates, we can call the normal stresses in cylindrical coordinates r tau rr, tau theta theta, and tau z z. So these are going to be our normal stresses in the cylindrical coordinates. So we will remember that when we're looking at our equations on the next slide. So going back to the Weissenberg effect, we have equation one here that we derived previous. So this is the equation of motion in the r direction. So we can actually take this equation and rearrange it to get equation number four here. So then we can integrate this term here, this equation four, uh, from the radius of a to the radius of b, and we can get this equation five here, which is the one we'll be looking at. So on this side, we have the pressure difference plus the stress applied. And then we have on the right hand side, the centrifugal force term. And we also have the, the term that includes the normal stress difference. And actually for a Newtonian fluid, the velocity postulate says that the normal stresses all have to equal zero. So what this does is it simplifies equation five down to an equation that only depends on the centrifugal force here. So since the centrifugal force here has to be positive, that means that PB minus PA also has to be greater than zero. So that explains the PB is greater than PA for the Newtonian fluid. Now for the non-Newtonian fluid that undergoes the Weissenberg effect, actually this term needs to be negative, right? Because PA minus PB needs to be greater than zero. So this needs to be negative. And to make this negative, this difference here needs to be sufficiently negative. So that normal stress difference, so the normal stress difference needs to be sufficiently negative in order to make the left-hand side of the equation negative. So that means that since we don't actually know if the the normal stresses in the case of the non-Newtonian fluid are zero. We can't say they're equal to zero like we can with the Newtonian fluid. So this term here, this normal stress difference is actually how we explain the Weissenberg effect in a non-Newtonian fluid. So it's this term that contributes negatively to this leading to that pressure difference. Additionally, we actually know what this contributes to. So this normal stress difference, this tau theta theta minus tau rr actually contributes to something called the hoop stress. So essentially this difference here causes tension along the streamline. So there's this tension along the streamline here. And since we have the tension along the streamline, but we're working in cylindrical coordinates, you end up having this streamline that circles all around here. So it circles all the way around, essentially making a hoop. So that's where we get the, the term hoop stress from. We essentially have this stress that's pulling the fluid up along the rod here, which is not seen for Newtonian fluids. So now that we've been introduced to this idea of a normal stress difference, we're gonna look at it a little bit more, but this time we're gonna look at it in terms of a much more simple geometry. So let's move on to that. Moving to a simpler geometry here, we can actually define something called the Weissenberg number. We can define it using the normal stresses and shear stress that we talked about on the previous slides. So essentially what the Weissenberg number, Wi represents, is a ratio of the elastic forces to viscous forces in a flowing fluid. So just like how the Reynolds number describes the ratio of the inertial forces to viscous forces, the Weissenberg number describes the ratio of the elastic forces to the viscous forces. And we can actually define this in a bit more mathematical sense than just the elastic over viscous forces. So we can look at this uh, simple steady flow geometry here, uh, which has these assumptions listed here. So these are the basic assumptions that you'll see typically for any kind of steady state shear flow experiment. So we can define an axis on here. So this is the x direction and this is the y direction. 
And for this geometry, we can actually define the elastic forces as the normal stress difference. So this would be tau xx minus tau yy. So just like how we talked about the normal stress difference on a previous slide, we're using that normal stress difference again to describe the elastic forces in this number. The viscous forces, on the other hand, can be described by the shear in the fluid, so that shear can be represented by tau xy. So essentially, this is, if we think back to how we described the, the stress tensor, this is going to be the stress that is in the that is on like the x face of this, so the x plane, but in the y direction. So this describes the viscous forces that we have acting on our system. So an example of how this Weissenberg number can be used is, say you have a Newtonian fluid. As we described previous, these normal stress tensors here are going to both equal zero. So for our Newtonian fluid, we're going to have a Weissenberg number that's equal to zero. This is for Newtonian. And this makes sense because for a Newtonian fluid, the overwhelming force that's going to be controlling our flow and giving us a profile like this linear profile here are going to be those viscous forces. Whereas for a polymer solution, like what we were looking at for the uh, Weissenberg effect, you're going to have a viscoelastic fluid. So there are going to be these elastic forces that are impacting your flow. In this lecture, we described the Weissenberg effect and the influence of normal stresses on fluid behavior. We explained this phenomena through integral analysis and the introduction of stress tensors. We also touched on the Weissenberg number. While this lecture only touched on the mathematical justifications, many simplifying assumptions were made, and further study through experimentation and differential analysis should be conducted to get a full understanding of the Weissenberg effect.